In March 2023, Xi Jinping visited Moscow for a historic summit with his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin. Observers in the West worried that this would renew their friendship and see a blank check of weapons shift from Beijing to the Russian front lines in Ukraine. Yet it ended up being a whole bunch of nothing for Russia. What happened? The logic behind the West's concern was sensible, even if the full reasoning formed a bit of a tangled web. The 21st century was supposed to herald in the rise of China, but standing in Beijing's way was the West. 2022 introduced a new strategic dimension. Russia initiated an invasion of Ukraine. Obviously, the West is backing Ukraine, both fiscally and militarily. If Russia fails, the West will grow stronger and be a bigger barrier to China's rise. Thus, China might want to prop up Russia to prevent that from happening, or at least to further drain Western coffers. But after their ostensibly historic summit, that didn't happen. It still could, of course. But as of now, it does not appear that it will. And the silence is deafening. So where did the logic fail? To help make some sense of things, let's discuss China's priorities in regard to the conflict, beginning with China's confusing official position on sovereignty. As the 2022 Olympic Games began in Beijing, Russia and China issued a joint declaration that their friendship had no limits. And, at first glance, it may appear that the two countries are ideologically aligned. Appearances aside, though, their positions are actually far apart, and the difference isn't just about COVID protocols. Only days later, Russia's invasion of Ukraine made evident the limits of their no-limits friendship. When the United Nations Security Council voted on whether to convene an emergency session of the General Assembly three days after the invasion began, China demonstrated its lack of limits by abstaining. That resolution passed anyway, and on March 2nd, the General Assembly held its first vote of the special session, demanding that Russia withdraw. China demonstrated its lack of limits by abstaining. Indeed, very few countries voted on Russia's side at all. The General Assembly doubled down 22 days later and added new concerns about civilian targeting. In response, China abstained. On October 12th, the special session voted on whether to condemn Russia's annexation of the eastern sections of Ukraine, China, you guessed it, abstained. Then there was a vote on whether to suspend Russia's membership on the Human Rights Council, in response to concerns of human rights violations that occurred during Russia's withdrawal from Bucha. In addition, there was a separate vote to demand that Russia pay war reparations to Ukraine. China? Actually, I may have tricked you there. China voted against those two. In sum, we may have found the limit line of the limitless friendship. China does not condone war, but also wants to protect Russia from the consequences beyond the battlefield. And unsurprisingly, it all goes back to Taiwan. China sees Russia's invasion as a violation of Ukrainian sovereignty. And that is a topic that Beijing is very sensitive about. According to the mainland version of the One China policy, Beijing is sovereign over Taiwan, even if the government in Taipei has de facto control over the island. Any attempt to change that, presumably by Taipei and perhaps with Western assistance, would violate that sovereignty. Thus, Beijing cannot support the invasion of Ukraine. It instead opts for the gentleman's abstention so as to be considerate to Moscow. In turn, the only reason for China to provide military aid would be strategic. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the coercive benefit vis-a-vis -vis the West. At some level, the logic of buffing up Russia to force the West to provide further assistance makes sense. But the key question is whether the return on the investment 
would more than cover its cost. There is an implicit assumption here that every standardized unit of currency that China spends somehow results in a larger drain of Western supplies. It is not obvious why that would be true. In fact, the available evidence points the opposite way. Ask yourself, if both Ukraine and Russia receive one extra tank, who is better off? The side with corruption up and down its military ranks, whose soldiers often turn tanks into scrap to sell for a little bit of money, who has trouble having its soldiers comply with orders, and who has consistently had its tanks walk right into opposing traps, leading to untold quantities of material losses, or the side that is receiving integrated training and needs more materiel to go on the offensive. Regardless of that, any military drain from the West would have to go through a roundabout mechanism. Given where Taiwan is situated, U.S. military power there is all about the Navy. Unsurprisingly, the U.S. Navy has done very little during the invasion of Ukraine. It's a land-based war in Europe, after all. The place where the U.S. Navy could have an effect is in the Black Sea, but access to it runs through the Bosporus Strait, and Turkey restricted passage of military ships through there at the start of the war. As a result, the Navy has treated the Russia-Ukraine war as an afterthought, even though the conflict dominated 2022's headlines. Their focus is still much further east, toward Taiwan and Russia. In turn, the U.S. Navy is not draining its supplies as the West makes transfers to Ukraine. In the long run, the other branches that are bearing the bulk of the transfers will need their supplies replaced. That comes out of a central, political budget, which might cause the Navy to feel a bit squeezed once budgets become tight. The point here is that the pathway in which China provides aid to Russia and becomes militarily better off against the West is convoluted. The pathway to a strategic victory on the political front is also dubious. Regarding the West, perhaps prolonging the war will cause NATO to break apart. This was part of the vision Putin had at the beginning of the war, but it has yet to come to fruition. So far, much to the Kremlin's dismay, we have only seen the opposite. Before the current tensions, Finnish support for NATO membership stood at just 24%. Fast forward just a single year, and that figure jumped to 85%. It took a while for Hungary and Turkey to approve Finland's membership, but they finally got on board. Finland officially entered the alliance on April 4th, 2023. Sweden has also sought membership since the war began, but despite further foot-dragging from Turkey and Hungary, few doubt that its ascent into the alliance is also inevitable. Extending the war could cause more fissures to form, sure, but introducing another major power could also cause a blowback effect. The EU and NATO have taken lead roles in supporting Ukraine, which makes sense given their proximity to the conflict. But think about what we might call the non-West West, in particular Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. They are clearly aligned with Ukraine and have provided aid, but they are not internalizing the war in the same way as, say, the United Kingdom, Poland, or Germany are. Chinese military patronage to Russia might change that, and thereby further unite the Western-oriented polities from both hemispheres. Indeed, as Xi Jinping toured Moscow, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida visited Kyiv. Quite a coincidence, isn't it? Less coincidentally, the foreign ministers of NATO's Pacific partners, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and South Korea, met at NATO's Brussels headquarters on April 5th. That is something that Chinese policymakers need to keep in the backs of their heads. Meanwhile, China has a delicate needle to thread within its own coalition. 
As the 21st century's rising power, China's goal is to be the leading party vis-a-vis -vis Russia. If there were any doubt that Beijing already had that role before the war, Russia's performance thus far has cast that aside. Putin is not going to be formally acknowledging Xi as the head of the Eastern Table anytime soon, but that is the de facto reality. At this point, China's greater concern is ensuring that Russia remains a useful coalition partner after the war ends. And to keep Russia on an island of relevancy, oddly enough, China might prefer to not provide aid. Right now, the West is not taking any casualties in the war, but Russia is, and likely at an alarming rate. If donating military supplies encourages Russia to continue a wasteful war, then China would want to be stingy. Nevertheless, there is still a perverse way that Russia's poor performance might still force China's hand. The worse Russia does in the war, the greater the chance that a domestic competitor challenges Putin for power. It would not be surprising to learn that Putin has considered updating his passport. And indeed, if Putin fails, China must worry that a Western-facing liberal might replace him. How can China ensure that Putin does not end up all by himself? Aid, in its most basic form, moves the expected outcome of the war in Russia's preferred direction. China, therefore, may want to strike a balance in limiting Putin's ability to continue fighting and ensuring that Russia won't completely collapse. However, there remains a factor more important to China than any of this. Here comes the money. Democratic governments tend to derive their legitimacy via the electoral process. In contrast, China does not have meaningful elections. Consequently, the Communist Party of China can only derive legitimacy to its rule through good governance. And for decades now, that has meant a growing economy. As it relates to the war, Improving the economy was a delicate balancing act for China. Immediately after Putin announced the start of the invasion, China became a direct beneficiary of the hostilities. With sanctions banning oil and gas in the West, China was all too happy to purchase energy at a steep discount. Consider Brent Oil versus Urals Oil. Those names don't actually line up with their regions perfectly, but the key is that Brent is Western and Urals is Russian. The price difference helps us track the effect of the sanctions regime. At the start of 2022, Brent crude only demanded a $2 premium over Russian Urals oil. This is normal given the quality difference between the two blends. Since the war began, the premium has ranged between $22 and $37, and there are indications that China at times has bought Russian oil at a further 40% discount. Outside the energy sector, Russia has become more reliant on Chinese imports to keep its manufacturing sector running. This indirectly supports the war effort, as attritional battles demand the production of more materiel. All told, the sanctions regime has caused a massive cash transfer from Moscow to Beijing, which apparently creates a huge incentive for China to keep the war going. Let's put these incentives into a collective category of trade benefits. At the same time, China faces two countervailing factors. To begin, continued conflict generally increases the probability of a global recession something that would be especially painful coming off the heels of the pandemic. In addition, active participation in arming risks drawing Western sanctions to Beijing. Thus, insofar as aid prolongs the war, it seems initially that arming Russia would help on the first dimension, but hurt on the other two. However, more than a year of fighting may have changed China's thought process on energy windfalls. Back at the beginning of the war, U.S. policymakers were careful to describe sanctions as conditional. For example, 
Secretary of State Antony Blinken summarized the U.S. position like this. If the war ends, Ukraine's independence, territorial integrity, and sovereignty are restored, then many of the tools we're using to get that result will end. The sanctions are not designed to be permanent. Perhaps counterintuitively, conditional sanctions, and not permanent sanctions, help Ukraine's bargaining position. Let me explain with some lines on maps. Imagine that this line from earlier represents the expected outcome of the war if fought to a military conclusion. But war is costly. The space between the white line and this red line represents Russia's lost blood and treasure if Moscow continues to fight. The key insight is that Ukraine can hold Russia to the red line at the bargaining table. That's effectively what Moscow gets by continuing to fight. But remember, the space in between the lines represents what Russia loses by continuing the conflict. If sanctions are permanent, they are not a cost for war. They are a price for merely existing. Russia, therefore, has less disincentive to fight. This effectively pushes the red line back toward the white line, thereby making it harder for Ukraine to get what it wants, and hence Blinken's emphasis on keeping sanctions conditional. Nevertheless, the plausibility of conditional sanctions diminished greatly over the first year of fighting, for a variety of reasons. To start, we still don't know who destroyed Nord Stream, and the question has only become murkier since our last discussion of it, with Seymour Hersh's claim that the U.S. was responsible, and the corresponding backlash regarding the number of inconsistencies in Hersh's reporting. Then the New York Times reported that U.S. intelligence believed it was either Ukrainians, with or without government approval, or an unknown Russian opposition group that did it. Then German intelligence started having questions about Poland's potential involvement. Worse, there is a good chance that we will never know. The Washington Post reports that NATO has developed a norm at their meetings. Don't talk about Nord Stream. And that makes sense. Discovering that Russia was at fault would not sway public opinion in any meaningful way. In contrast, a Western ally finding proof that Ukraine, or a fellow Western ally, was responsible, would be problematic. It would not alter the general consensus on whom the West would want to support, but it would make for some politically awkward conversations when you are trying to take a family photo. Given that, it makes sense to just not talk about Nord Stream and have your intelligence organizations exert effort on more productive projects. However, Regardless of how Nord Stream was destroyed, the fact is that the system is mostly broken and will not be coming back anytime soon. Even if Russia were to leave Ukraine tomorrow, Germany cannot easily turn back on the Russian gas flow, and nor would it want to. Once the war began, Germany raced to install liquid natural gas terminals. With those startup costs now paid, Alternate exporters are lining up, making it easier for Germany to avoid Russian gas. Zooming out to trade more broadly, the longer the war goes, the harder it is to imagine that Western businesses will be rushing back to Russia. Part of that is because Russia cannot credibly guarantee the stability of those investments, and businesses do not like uncertainty. And to be clear, investment will be necessary, as much of the former Western holdings fled following the imposition of sanctions. But another part is sheer optics. How would a company's customers feel about doing business with a country whose leader is wanted by the International Criminal Court? By analogy, think about why Western companies do not partner with North Korea. It's not just the economic sanctions or potential for significant domestic upheaval. Russia is fast fading into the same level of pariah status. All told, China will not lose much of its economic gains if it walks out of a military assistance program and the war ends. It appears to be mostly downside at this point, despite the Kremlin's pleas otherwise. 
Interestingly, this creates a countervailing incentive to Blinken's permanent sanctions problem from earlier. It remains true that Russia's opportunity costs for continued war may have declined due to the permanence of economic sanctions. But if that permanence means that China will not interfere, then the expected outcome shifts in Ukraine's favor. That's a decent consolation prize for Kyiv. To be clear, none of what I have said implies that China will never provide aid to Russia. Beijing could change its mind, or become worried about Putin's ability to stay in office like we described earlier, which she might find crucial if he wants to keep the birthday cakes flowing. At that point, China's monetary and soft power concerns might fade into the background. Now, if that were to happen, we would likely hear about it. Unless China made very small transfers, which in theory could already be the case, it will be hard for Beijing to hide it in the long run. North Korea could act as an intermediary to launder weapons and thereby delay the world's discovery, but that would still be noticeable at scale. Meanwhile, Chinese troop deployments seem very far-fetched, given that Beijing does not directly care about the war's stakes. Still, it is enough of a concern that Kyiv is making overtures to Beijing, and that will likely continue for a while. If you want to know more about the invasion, you will love my book that investigates its many possible causes. Check below for more information on that. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. We did just hit 400,000. And I will see you next time. Take care. For the last outro, we discussed the Where's Putin Easter eggs hidden in my previous seven videos. For those of you that missed that, I have hidden this photo of Putin in the background of those videos, and also today's video, and likely every video for the foreseeable future. After this video, I will likely show the answers as community posts. But to start things off, I will go over them here. This is your last chance to click away before I reveal the answers. For Putin's miscalculation video, I put him in the middle of Congress during Trump's first impeachment. For who's trapping whom, I had him spying on an idyllic G7 summit. I think this one was a bit easier because no one is around him. For the Battle of Kyiv, he continued his spying ways, this time in the gallery of the Ukrainian Rada. It pays to know what your opponents are up to. For Russia's damn gamble, I had Putin surveying the scene of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Very kind of him to assist the IAEA inspectors. For the Battle of Crimea, I had him in the White House Situation Room. I imagine people saw him when the video was first released, but probably figured it was just whatever Obama wanted to see during the meeting. For the ICC Warrant video, Putin decided to examine what goes on at a Biden rally. And finally, for the combat compliance problem video, Putin then tried to see whom Biden voted for. I like this one because it took some effort on my part to hide him behind a bag of cookies and a roll of paper towels. Once again, he is hiding in this video. Be sure to use hashtag Where's Putin in the comments along with a timestamp to let me know that you have found him. Your hint for today is that he is not looking for maple syrup. Good luck and have fun.